really going to like this book. I like the fact that you go back and, and, and to uh, very old history and bring it up to the, the current level in so many different countries and in so many different ways. And as you pointed out, of course, as everybody knows, after World War II, the U.S. was essentially in the catbird seat. Uh, they were untouched uh, domestically in terms of production. They had most of the world's manufacturing capacity, a large part of the world's gold. And as you pointed out, as that commodity uh, started to come under pressure, they moved over to essentially using oil as the economy. As, as the commodity that's backing the currency. I had never really thought about it that way before. Yeah, and you know what's interesting about all this? The average American, and you never hear about this, but you know, it's sad for people to realize that even within the U.S. for the last 25 years, the American electricity matrix has depended about 10%. One in every 10 homes in America is powered by Russian nuclear fuel. Well, you hang on, we're going to be right back. We've got to go to commercial break with Marin Katusa, The Colder War. Stay with us. Points out he's one of the most successful fund managers in the energy and resource exploration sectors. His hands-on approach has taken him around the world, and he really understands the historical context. This is an excellent book here, The Colder War, published by Casey Publishing. And, of course, that's uh, Doug Casey's uh, group, and uh, Doug Casey has been a guest with the, uh, on, here with Alex several times. Now, just before we went to the uh, break, Mr. Katusa, you started to talk about the U.S. dependence on Russian oil. Tell us about that. Well, it's, it's actually the Russian nuclear fuel, uranium, yes, sorry. and yeah. it's shocking to me that, you know, last year, for example, a Russian company produced more uranium on American soil than all of the American companies combined. That's shocking to me. Hmm. The, the, um, America depends, imports 90% of the uranium it consumes, and America is the largest consumer of uranium in the world, and more importantly, 10%, one out of 10%. Ten, one out of every 10 homes in America is powered by Russian nuclear fuel. This is shocking. You know, these are risks that people aren't talking about right now that Americans need to know. It needs to be brought up to the politicians so we can change this failed foreign policy. And of course, our energy, our access to cheap energy affects not only our lifestyle, but even our health, our longevity in any country. You can go back and you can show that access to cheap energy is the biggest producer of wealth in any country. Putin understands that. He has built his global plan, as you point out in the book, on the rich natural resources of Russia in terms of being very rich in oil and natural gas in terms of uranium. Uh, on the other hand, we have a president who, even before he came into office, said he was going to shut down the coal industry. He said you could build it, but it's going to, you could build a, a coal plant, but it's going to bankrupt you. It looks to me like what he's trying to do is, is, is bankrupt the country. I, either by design or by incompetence, the collateral damage of what uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Arabia is doing with the oil prices, they may be aiming that at uh, Putin or they may be aiming it at domestic competition from oil shale, but uh, either way, it it is very destructive of um, of our country's wealth, and it's something that is being that our closest ally, Saudi Arabia, that we supposedly are protecting, uh, is doing against us, not just against the Russians. You've nailed it. I, I'm really enjoying the show because as a as a host, as an interviewer, you're really hitting all of the, the key subjects here. And I do hundreds of these interviews a year, and it's very rare that someone actually understands this to the depth you do. And what's really critical here is exactly as you stated, I see OPEC with Russia and the U.S. production in a three-way war. It's about market share. And mm -hmm. what's critical to the petrodollar, U.S. went from the largest customer to OPEC and Saudi Arabia to now a major competitor to Saudi Arabia and Qatar and UAE, where NGLs, natural gas liquids and condensates are now competing for Qatar and Saudi market share. At the same time, the Russians are also competing with it. And ironically, what's going to happen is the side effect, U.S. shale production cannot compete with Russian production or Saudi or the OPEC Gulf, the Arab states production. So you're going to see an implosion within the U.S. corporate oil producers because of the debt level and it's going to hurt because where have all the big high paying jobs in, in obama's administration happened it didn't happen in its green bubble revolution which is completely <laughs> popped and failed it's happened in the bakken where it's the lowest employment rates yeah. in america it's happened in the eagleford it's the american uh, energy revolution that has caused these high paying jobs and these high paying jobs are at risk and of course, Marin, I just read yesterday on the news here, uh, there was an article from The Telegraph in the UK talking about 
Well, this falling oil price is going to be good for us in the short term as consumers at the gas pump. But, you know, we're going to have to keep level or maybe even increase rates to consumers for heating their homes because we're going to have to subsidize our renewable resources. So they're not even going to pass along a temporary savings because we know this is temporary. Once Saudi Arabia or OPEC reestablishes their hegemony in, in energy prices, you're going to see it skyrocket again. That's always the game for the big guys to drive, to take a loss. They can, they can hold on and take a loss for a while until they drive out their upcoming uh, competitors. And then once they do, Katie, bar the door. They're going to hit us really hard. Exactly. And Germany is even in a worse situation than the UK. Look at Germany. A lot of people don't realize that in the last decade, they've actually increased their oil imports from the former USSR by over 52%. Mm. You look at their gas imports. Germany needs the Russian oil and gas to keep its economy going. And Germany's the the economic engine of Europe. So Europe is so vulnerable here. Well, you know, one of the things that, that we'll talk about, we're running out of time for this segment, we've got to go to a break, and we're going to come back and talk about Putin, because one of the things I liked about your book is it isn't a hagiography, and it isn't a cartoon demon characterization of Putin. You show how he's dangerous, how he's competitive, how his interests do not ally but compete with ours in, in many ways. I want to talk about that, and I want to talk about the petrodollar. You've got a chapter on post-petrodollar. We'll talk about that after we come back with Marin Katusa. The book is The Colder War. The Stay March. with us. Before the break, uh, Marin, we were talking about um, uh, the, the. I said I wanted to cover uh, Putin's rise as well as the petrodollar. But before we get to that, I wanted to get your comments as a fund manager about what's going on. Which is, I just saw a uh, notice that Comex is going to implement gold and silver price limit collars uh, effective on the twenty first. They're going to uh, limit. Price fluctuations will kick in at $100 moves in gold and $3 moves in silver. What are they concerned about? Looks like uh, the Russian uh, currency is, is crumbling. We've got derivatives and oil that are coming in. It looks like a very unstable time, doesn't it? It really is. And as an investor, whether you're a fund manager, even at a retail level for all the mom and pops out there, what you have to understand is it's not true capitalism as uh, Bud Conrad, an economist at Casey Research says. It's about interventions and understanding what's going on. So if you look at Obama's administration, I would sum it up as he has increased the debt of the American government by over 50 percent under his watch. And he's made the worst decision. So I call it financial heroin. He's, a, he's made the system addicted to finance heroin and the worst thing for your viewers to understand to have is going into the next uh, evolution and sector of this colder war is to be exposed to the debt because look what the russians are going through right now if your interest rates go up and you're exposed to margin calls or or increased volatility be very careful and that's why the derivatives when you mentioned them earlier are so critical because as the petrodollar does collapse and it will then you get the derivatives kick in and who's going to control this we're talking about you know quadrillions of dollars numbers that people can't even fathom we're in uncharted territory here and we're already seeing oil derivatives coming under a lot of pressure many of them are already uh worthless people are scrambling to cover that i, I mean it, it's just the 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 coming tidal wave of economic problems to me is just it, it's very apparent all these forces that are building up at the end of the year right now very very worrying let's talk for a moment about vladimir putin before we talk about the uh, consequences you got a chapter in your book called uh, post petrodollar i want to talk about the consequences of what happens when the uh, we lose the petrodollar here in america but let's talk about putin talk about his his rise to power what makes this guy tick well it's not money you know, when you look at a lot of politicians, he's the exact opposite of Obama. What Putin truly believes is his mission on Earth is to bring Russia back to its previous greatness under Peter the Great. You know, a good ideology of him is when he came into power, you know, he was the head of the, uh, basically what the we call the old KGB. This guy is a Soviet-trained, uh, he's brilliant, but he's driven by national pride. And he you hung up a out photo of not let me, let me give a, an anecdote from your book. You, you pointed out that his grandfather, who essentially mentored him, uh, was somebody who was a cook for Lenin and then Stalin. He managed to survive the purges, and there were even rumors that he was with the NKVD. Uh, this is a guy that had a lot of influence on him, and at an early age, 
he, uh, Putin went to the KGB and wanted to know uh, what he could do. And you, you report in his book that they told him, well, the best thing you could do if you want to get in the KGB is get into uh, get a law degree. And they came looking for him when he went to law school and, and recruited him at the age of 22. This is a guy who wanted, he was caught up in the James Bond type of espionage stuff. They had their own version of it in Russia. He was caught up in that. He got very in interested in martial arts, wanted to be a KGB person. He's got a much different, longer-term point of view than Obama, doesn't he? <laughs> oh, definitely. And he's, he's working with the Chinese who plan in 20, 30-year cycles. Obama plans, according to his Twitter account, which is by seconds. So, you know, you can't compare the two. But more importantly, what this is all doing and the, the, the real threat here in the colder war is the emerging markets are now working closer together than ever before. And the Western markets, you know, the old allies of the U.S. are trying to sit here and well, we can't do what the Americans want anymore. For example, Germany was really being pushed by the American sanctions onto Russia, but now Germany's painted in a corner. So really, Obama's isolated his allies and more importantly, has pushed his enemies closer together. You, you point out that as uh, we enact these trade sanctions, we're essentially throwing fire on the de-dollarization in terms of removing the uh, dollar as, as reserve currency. Explain that. Well, sanctions are just another form of war. Everyone's going to lose in a sanction. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's sad that it's got to go that way because there's so many better alternatives. But the sanctions are going to come back and they've already backfired on the german economy it's starting to backfire on other european economies and remember winter's coming and eastern europe and western europe depends about a third of its natural gas on russia russia's not down and out never underestimate the russians they have survived things that most people can't even fathom and obama is underestimating you know remember when in the debate uh with romney when romney said russia is our greatest threat and obama laughed and said what are you talking about the cold war ended 20 years ago obama's <laughs> completely clueless to what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so is the American public, too. They don't remember, as you point out in your book, you said the, at one time Ukraine was Russia. At the beginning of the interview, you pointed out that it looks like uh, Putin is going to move uh, nuclear weapons into Crimea. They're not about to let Crimea go, are they? No, definitely. There's four key, uh, key critical elements that uh, is about Crimea. First of all, over 90% of the people are Russian and Russian speaking. So if you understand Putin's strategy, what I call the Slavic warrior mentality, he's not going to let any Russian be suppressed or be threatened. More importantly, it's about the gas pipeline. Second, the offshore oil and gas deposits. It's a deep sea warm port, which is very important for Russian's military. And fourth, the key criti critical part that no media is talking about is if Crimea stayed in even Ukraine or Eastern Ukraine, Ukraine could now import U.S. and European goods and trade them to the former USSR states at a tax advantage that the Russians couldn't. So it's also a threat to the U.S. manufacturing strategy, and Putin won't have any of it. And they will defend Crimea as they will defend Moscow. You point out in your book, you go back to the uh, Rose Revolution uh, in Georgia, talking about how at that time, South Ossetia and another territory tried to secede from uh, Georgia. And of course, at that point in time, we were against uh, self-rule and self-government, just as we've seen with the Ukraine situation. Uh, you know, we are for Ukraine seceding from uh, the Soviet, uh, well, from Russia, and then we oppose Crimea seceding from the Ukraine. I mean, there's absolutely, cannot make a coherent argument for this. It's just naked power politics that they're playing here with the, uh, with the energy th uh, that's going on here. It's like, uh, draw some parallels between the Rose Revolution and what we have just seen in the Ukraine with the Maiden Revolution. Sure. So the Rose was first, and it was really funded by the NGOs, American money, Western money coming in. And it, it was the beginning. But at the time, Putin didn't yet solidify. He didn't take on the oligarchs yet at the time. He didn't control the domestic Russian oil and gas and resources. So he kind of stayed put and let things develop. Then we had the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, and that was big. That was very important. That really showed a shift. And now the Maiden Revolution is really the EU versus Russia, and the EU is backed by America. And it's really the American incentive to fight the Russian foreign politics here. And it's a retaliation that most people in the West did not expect because they thought Putin would back down. That is not the situation. And if you want to compare it to, let's say, the former uh, Yugoslav Republic of Kosovo, you know, where America defended Kosovo is exactly what Russia is now doing for their side. So, you know, we've been seeing flip flop politics, and there's a lot of uh, flags of awareness and failed foreign policy 
on the western sides and remember putin's going to do exactly what's best for russia's long-term strategy if it means going to economic war or physical war or supplying weapons or moving the nuclear weapons into crimea putin won't think twice about it absolutely he's got a long-term